and it keeps doing that after I've tested it. Very good. Uh, let us start with a prayer and then we will begin the class. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. We especially thank you for the season of Advent that prepares our hearts to receive your Son, Jesus, and you. Help us to turn away from sin and turn towards you. Help us to experience a true conversion of heart so that our lives might be transformed by your grace. And we make this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to change this out and use the handheld. So what we're talking about tonight are chapters uh, 14 and 15. Of, we're beginning the study of the sacraments and we're going to have a general overview of the sacraments and then uh, a specific uh, reflection upon the sacrament uh, of baptism. But the chapter begins with uh, us trying to understand what the word liturgy is. But before I go further, I need uh, my little syllabus to be passed out to everybody here. There's about 50 copies, so I don't know if I have enough for everybody. You'll hear Catholics refer to the services of the Catholic Church in many different ways. The most generic term for the services of the Catholic Church is, or the prayers of the Catholic Church when they're prayed together uh, in community, is the word liturgy, which comes from the Greek term meaning public work or work done on behalf of the people. As far as liturgy is concerned in terms of the religious significance of it, it is the public prayer of the church on behalf of the people in which we give praise and honor to Almighty God. So as such, all the liturgies of the church, whether the Mass, the Liturgy of the Hours, Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, the public recitation of the Holy Rosary, or other prayer services, Worshippers are expected to participate actively in each liturgy, for this is holy work. It is not entertainment or a spectator sport. So when we go to Mass on Sunday, we're called to, be, to enter into the worship of the church and to see ourselves as having a very important role in the worship of the church, that we're not there as though we're attending a, a Broadway play or a concert or, or a lecture for that matter uh, and we just kind of sit there and absorb what's happening. In, in the worship of the Catholic Church we're called to participate in the best way we can by actively participating. And there are two aspects of this active participation. The first is what we call internal that we're trying to absor ab absorb as much of what is occurring during the process of the church's liturgy uh, and, and uh, our participation in it by truly being in tune with what God is doing for us through the liturgy that the church has given us. But the liturgy is given to us by God. The church discerns how that should be, but it's a gift to us from God that enables us to experience who God is, to worship God, enter into his real, enter into his real presence. So there has to be an internal disposition of opening, openness to God in that regard. Now, in the Catholic Church, up until about 1966, 67, maybe a little earlier or a little bit later, depending on where you live, the Catholic Mass used to be exclusively in Latin. And when you came to Mass on Sunday, you didn't open your mouth. Uh, you just kind of came in, genuflected, said your quiet prayers, and then Mass began. And the only people that participated verbally 
were, uh, was the priest, but many of his parts were done silently. The altar servers who res responded to the greetings and, and the other things. And then the choir who would have sung the glory of the creed, the holy, holy, the Lamb of God. Everybody else just kind of uh, was there. Okay? And would you say that those who were there were participating? Yes. Yes. But they were participating internally. Now, the church in that period of time, especially in the, the 1940s and 50s, encouraged Catholics to have a, a book that gave you the translation of the Mass in English. So you'd have on one side of the book uh, the Latin, and on the other side the English um, um, translation of that. And you were asked to pray quietly those prayers as the priests pray them aloud and the altar servers or the choir uh, responded out loud. So the expectation was that you would be participating but internally. After the Second Vatican Council, the uh, Second Vatican Council asked that the church uh, modernize the rites of the church, uh, modernize the Catholic Mass, allow for uh, the vernacular, in our case English, and that the laity would start participating externally in the ways that the altar boys and the choir had done in the past. So the laity would respond when the priest said, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. They would join the choir in singing the Gloria. Uh, they would join in the responsorial psalm and the Alleluia. Uh, they would recite the creed together, the Holy Holy they would sing, the mystery of faith, great amen, uh, the communion songs, uh, the Lamb of God, so on and so forth. And that was, that's what we call external. And I would say that in terms of our participation in the Mass and any of the sacraments of the Church, we need a combination of both. Uh, both the internal and the external. If one is emphasized to the uh, deficit or the detriment of the other, then we're really not participating as the Church asks us to participate, as God is asking us to participate. We're, we're, we're uh, doing our own thing, so to speak, or we're distracted uh, by what's going on. So the liturgy of the church, whether it's the mass, the liturgy of the hours, the liturgy of the hours is a, a, a set of prayers that priests must pray, nuns and monks must pray, and it sanctifies the day and it's based on the psalms of the church as well as uh, the psalms of the Old Testament as well as various prayers of the church. And this is our prayer book. There's a four volumes set for this for the different seasons of the church. This is an abbreviated form that has it all in one volume. It has morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer. Uh, and priests, nuns, and monks are required to pray those prayers to sanctify the day, uh, Monday through Sunday. Um, sometimes it's done more elaborately in community with a lot of singing and chanting. At other times, for most priests like me, we do it privately, quietly. Uh, our parish staff at 9 o'clock gets together every morning and prays morning prayer, uh, which begins with a, a, a greeting, has three sets of psalms, a reading, a response to the reading, intercessions, the Lord's Prayer, and a closing prayer. And it takes about, if you pray it together out loud, it takes maybe 15 minutes uh, at the most to do. So this is a liturgy of the church as well. If you go upstairs on Wednesdays uh, for our benediction, we have an abbreviated form of, of evening prayer from the Liturgy of the Hours plus the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. That is a liturgy. So when we use the word liturgy, that is a very generic term that could refer to any of the public communal prayers uh, of the church and sometimes even those which are done privately. And the liturgy is centered on the Most Holy Trinity. We direct our worship to God the Father, from whom all blessings come through Jesus Christ his Son in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And through the liturgical celebrations of the church we participate in the Paschal Mystery, that's a, a big word, um, uh, which means the passing of Christ through death from this life into, into glory. And just as God enabled the people of the Old Testament, the Israelites, to pass from slavery to freedom through the events narrated in the book of Exodus, so too does Jesus allow us to pass from sin uh, to forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life in heaven through his uh, life here on earth, 
his death on the cross, his resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And all of that combined is called um, the um, Paschal Mystery. Now, all the sacraments of the church uh, are based upon what we call the incarnational or sacramental principle. In the Revised Creed, which you're not hearing anymore since we're di dismissing you on Sunday after the homily, uh, we say that by the Holy Spirit, um, Jesus became flesh or incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary and became man. The word incarnate means the Spirit of God or God who is Spirit, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, becoming, f in becoming flesh through uh, uh, his conception in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that is what we call the incarnation, uh, uh, that God takes on flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit, but through uh, the Virgin Mary. Does anybody know what reincarnation is? We don't believe in, we don't believe in reincarnation, <laughs> but there's a similar uh, uh, principle involved that the Hindus say that your soul or your spirit comes back either as another person or as a fly or an ox or whatever. So you take flesh in some other creature. Uh, now Catholics don't believe in that. We do not believe in reincarnation. No Christian, as far as I know, believes in reincarnation, uh, I don't think. So, so that's a, 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 a something of other, of other religions. Uh, but the incarnation of Christ is only, only refers to, to Jesus Christ and how he took flesh through the Blessed Virgin Mary at the moment of his conception. However, next uh, Thursday, is that right? Yeah, next Thursday is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to what that refers to? That, that is not a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> is that when Mary was conceived? That is when Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother, whom the church calls Saint Anne. But she was conceived in the normal way between St. Anne and St. Joachim. But at the moment of conception, God preserved the Blessed Virgin Mary from original sin. All of us, except for the Blessed Virgin Mary, inherit original friend sin from our original parents, okay? The only person that was preserved from that, as far as we know, is the Blessed Virgin Mary, okay? And that's because God, from all eternity, knew that salvation would be brought to the world through his son Jesus Christ and that Mary would participate in that plan of salvation. And so he consecrated her from the moment of her conception to uh, be the mother of his son. Now he didn't take away her free will, okay? He didn't turn her into a robot. Uh, she could have technically said no uh, when the angel Gabriel asked her if she would conceive. Uh, in fact, the angel Gabriel says, Hail Mary, full of grace. Okay, did he say, Hail Mary, you got some grace? No, he said, Hail Mary, full of grace, uh, which implies that there was something unique about this woman compared to anybody else around, that she uh, was full of grace and that by God's grace, uh, she was chosen to be the mother of, of uh, his son. And so we would take that biblical passage where the Ga Gabriel says that she's full of grace and understand that as uh, preserving her from uh, the stain of original sin and giving her the grace necessary to avoid actual sin. So we believe that she didn't commit sin throughout her life. That she was created as Adam and Eve were first uh, created. Uh, without original sin, but with free will, they had an added benefit over the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what was their added benefit? Adam and Eve's added, added, added benefit. They lived in the Garden of Eden, and they saw God face to face, and he talked to them, okay? <laughs> the Blessed Virgin Mary did not have that, okay? But she was preserved from original sin, so she was similar to Adam and Eve before the fall. But when she was tempted, either to say no to God or to give in to sin, by God's grace, she was obedient. She never disobeyed God, okay? Uh, and so we look at that and say, well, then she must have had some special grace from the moment of her conception. Yeah, she did. She was just like Adam and Eve when they were first created. Except she did not say, uh, give in to temptation. Does everybody understand that? Okay. So it's not because she's like God. It's because she's human as God created her to be. So she is truly human. Okay. 
uh, but also that comes about by the grace of Almighty God. So the, 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 the incarnational or the sacramental principle of the church uh, is very important. God is the source and provider or actor of every sacrament. To understand the sacraments of the church theologically, uh, and not just from a, a, a visual point of view or studying it from a scientific point of view, uh, as a rite of passage or sociologically uh, for various occasions to build up community. We must understand that the foundational underpinnings of Catholicism is the incarnation of Christ. And the distinctive Catholic attitude to both the church and the sacrament stems from the conviction of the incarnation, the self-communication of God to humanity through the embodiment in the human and visible. Um, so, so God becomes visible and human in Jesus Christ, tangible and touchable and hearable and smellable, and uh, he will use the elements of the earth a lot of times in his miracles, right? He spits on the ground, makes some paste, mud, and smears it on the eyes of the man to be healed and of, of his blindness, and he can see again. Uh, that is the incarnational principle, that, that Jesus himself would take mud made with his spit and smear it with his hands on the eyes of someone who's blind, and after he tells them to go and wash it off with water, they can see again. You see what I'm talking about? That's the incarnational uh, principle of the sacraments of the church. So through signs and symbols, uh, Christ continues to care uh, for us, to cure us, uh, and to take care of us in tangible, sensual ways. In fact, the basis of all the sacraments is God's power to come to us and touch the complete person, the five senses of the person, sight, that's why we use in Catholic worship art, incense, which you can see is smoke, um, and all kinds of art like windows, icons, uh, paintings, murals, all the rest of that. He touches our sense of hearing with the spoken word, with music, with instruments. God t touches our, our sense of smell with perfume like balsams and incense which has a fragrance. He also uh, helps us to experience the sense of touch uh, through the laying on of hands, the anointing with oil and the feel of all of that, as well as taste, bread, wine, salt, water. But he also touches uh, another sense. Which sense do you think that is? The sixth sense, the supernatural. He, he brings us into communion with him. Uh, and in a mysterious, uh, grace-filled, binding way. So it's not just the physical that is touched, it is uh, the spiritual, the, the, the supernatural. Uh, so apart from um, uh, the seven defined sacraments of the church, which I'm going to go over briefly, uh, the sacramental principle is based upon two important incarnational realities. Jesus himself, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, is the sacrament of God, okay? Meaning that he makes visible and tangible the most holy trinity. So Jesus Christ himself is the sacrament of God. And then secondly, the church is the sacrament of Christ, the body of Christ, with Jesus as our head, the bride of Christ, with Jesus as our bridegroom. And the life of the body shows forth in an incarnational way Jesus Christ, the life of the church. Does everybody understand that? So Jesus himself is the sacramental sign of the Most Holy Trinity. The church is the sacramental sign of Jesus Christ. Is everybody following me? Anybody have a question there before I move on? Yes. Things you're talking about, the, the water and the bread. That too. Uh, that that the, the presence of Christ can be conveyed to us through the elements of the earth. So that, that physical manifestation. Correct, that. correct. Okay. Correct. Once it's sanctified or used sanctified or used for sacred purposes. Does everybody understand that? Okay, because the sacramental principle 
uh, is extremely important. Now, all of the sacraments of the church um, are instituted by Christ himself, but now using signs and symbols that point to the continuing ministry of the risen Lord. So, in the sacraments, we come into the real presence of Christ. Because as Catholics, we don't worship a dead hero, we worship the risen Lord. Okay? And that he's with us in 2011, December 1st, just as much as he was with us in the flesh 2,000 years ago. Uh, so that's the most important thing to keep in mind. That's a faith reality. I can't prove that to you. That is a gift from God, supernatural, if you will, uh, to understand and to believe that. So all of these were instituted by Christ, and all of the sacrament use some element of the earth, some incarnational element, whether it's water, or fire, or oil, um, or words, or incense, or song, or ritual, or human beings coming together. All of these are, are used uh, by God to make visible some aspect of who he is and what he continues to do in and through the church. Now, for us to understand that, we have to understand, first of all, that all of the sacraments use signs and symbols to point to the hidden presence or the invisible presence of Christ. You can see or uh, smell or taste or feel or hear the sign that points to something else that you cannot see, hear, smell, taste, or feel at the time that you experience the sign or the symbol. For example, clouds are a sign of rain. You see the clouds or hear the thunder before you actually experience the rain. A siren is a sign of an emergency. You hear the siren before you can actually see the emergency. Smoke is a sign of fire. You will see and smell the smoke before you actually see the flames. The American flag is the sign or a symbol of the USA. Uh, when you see the flag, you don't really see the USA, but it points to the, to the USA. Does that make sense? Um, so a sacrament is a church celebration that uses signs and symbols which point to the invisible but real presence of Jesus Christ and his continuing ministry in the church. To understand what a sacrament is and the signs that are used, we must first understand who Jesus Christ is and what he did in his public ministry when he walked here on earth some 2,000 years ago. First and foremost, he invited people to follow him to be a part of the kingdom of God that he was ushering in, in the here and now, as well as in the world to come. And what he did specifically was that he reached out to the rejected, he reached out to the sinner, he reached out to the despised, and he reached out to those who were most in need, and he healed them, or called them to conversion, or called them, uh, or offered them forgiveness, even before they asked for it. He was acting as God, because he was God. He tells us in his ministry that those most in need are the ones that he's reaching out because the Gospels tell us that the sick need a doctor, not the well. Jesus also preached about God's kingdom and, his, and God's love for us and gave people his spirit to continue his ministry. So he called us to love God with our entire being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We also know that Jesus enjoyed meals at people's homes and he gathered people together and united them uh, through meals and sometimes was found to be having meals with uh, uh, disreputable people uh, because he was reaching out to them. Jesus forgave sins and this was the most controversial aspect uh, uh, of Jesus' ministry for the Jews of the time because they understood only God could, could forgive sins, right? So when Jesus was forgiving sin, what do you think uh, a pious Jew would have thought? Because he wasn't saying, may God forgive you, he says, I forgive you, okay? Uh, kind of like what the priest does in confession. Um, they were thinking he was a heretic, or, or he's crazy, or who does he think he is? Well, what's implied there is precisely who he thinks he is. He's God. Um, now, you either accept or reject that, but that's what is implied. He gave authority of leadership to his 12 apostles, and he commissioned them to do what he did, because he was not a one-man show. Uh, Jesus likes to involve a lot of people in his ministry, right? He's not a celebrity. You know, how many of you are aware of the Crystal Cathedral in California and Reverend Schuler? 
Uh, his ministry is kind of a, was kind of a one-man show. It all hinged upon him and his personality. Now, as he got older, he tried to keep his ministry in the family because it was kind of like a business corporation, right? And he passed it on to his son, but his son was not quite as good as the father, and there was a falling out, and the son uh, started his own ministry somewhere else. So they, then he brought in his daughter to kind of continue his legacy, but she wasn't as good as the father and not evidently a very good administrator, and, and they went into bankruptcy, okay? And guess what? The Catholic Church just bought the Crystal Cathedral, okay? <laughs> and is turning it into the Catholic Cathedral of, of Orange County where Disneyland is. So it's very appropriate that the Catholic Cathedral looks a little bit like uh, um, Magic the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> it's very part of our, their culture there. Um, but the thing is that what... what it's California, but what, what happened was, and it can happen in the Catholic Church too, when the cult of the personality of the individual overpowers everything else, when that cult is gone, when that person dies or retires, everything collapses, right? But if our faith is in God and we see the ministers of the church simply representing him and that we're not looking towards to them to be uh, our entertainer or our charismatic leader or whatever, then when he dies or gets moved somewhere else, the church continues. It doesn't collapse and fall apart. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so that's, that's what Jesus tried to do, to create a church that did not hinge upon any one person, including himself, uh, when he would be visibly taken from them. Yes, Lucy? It's normal for the parents to get attached to their priests. It is normal, in, and that's a normal thing, but the problem is if the priest becomes too much of a cult figure, and then... Um, when he goes, nobody can replace him. Well, all of us can be replaced in the Catholic Church. The Pope can be replaced. So, uh, you know, John Paul II was more charismatic than Benedict XVI, but Benedict XVI has some gifts and talents that John Paul II didn't. And God gives us what we need at any particular time, okay? Uh, so it, it, we shouldn't um, expect uh, our leaders to be our messiahs. Only God is, or only Christ is. Okay. Uh, Jesus also gave a new dignity to marriage. He forbade divorce. In fact, um, uh, his very first miracle was at the wedding feast of Cana, when he turned uh, water into wine. In fact, the disciples will ask Jesus, you know, Moses allowed for uh, divorce. And what do you say? And Jesus said, well, that was because you were stubborn. I say that if a, a man uh, divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery in the same for uh, uh, the wife who divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And what do um, the apostles say to Jesus? Well, this is impossible. It would be better not to get married then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because who wants to stick with one person for the rest of your life? Uh, so <laughs> but Jesus was calling them to that uh, stability. Uh, of marriage, uh, and in fact did away with the liberality of Moses who did allow for uh, divorce here and there. And he also elevates marriage to uh, a sacrament, which we'll talk about later on uh, in a few minutes. So prior to giving, uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit, uh, there was a, a confusion, after Jesus had died on the cross and was buried, uh, and uh, after he came back to life, you know, the apostles were kind of reinvigorated again, but then 40 days later he ascends into heaven. And then there's like another 10 day period before the Holy Spirit comes, so the apostles are kind of befuddled again, they're disorganized, they're fearful, they're not sure exactly where to go from there. And then on Pentecost Sunday, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the uh, apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary in the upper room. And they were in, reinvigorated, encouraged, and given zeal to build the church and to continue the ministry of Jesus. They knew that the risen Lord was still with them, although invisibly through the Holy Spirit. But as time went by, they understood how close Jesus was, that he wasn't just a dead hero, but a living reality, although unseen. They understood more clearly that the church, meaning the people of God, had to show forth the love and ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. And so by the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given to them, they went about trying to make visible 
the hidden presence of Jesus Christ in obedience to what Jesus did when he walked here on earth. And very soon the church began to symbolize its faith in its celebrations of the liturgies of the church, in particular the seven sacraments. So what then is a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. The most important thing that I just said in that sentence is that uh, all seven sacraments are instituted by Christ. They're not made up by the church, not made up by the apostles, but instituted by Christ himself. This means that in the ministry of Jesus, he did certain things in his public ministry that he continues to do now in his risen ministry, but through now the church, meaning the apostles or the bishops, the priests who assist the, the bishops, the deacons, as well as the body of Christ, the, the baptized faithful. So just as Jesus is the sign of God and the church is the sign of Christ, the sacraments celebrate the mystery of the hidden presence of Christ and his paschal mystery in our midst by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the church uses the mystery of the sacraments to bring people into a deeper relationship with Almighty God, or I should say Christ uses the, uh, the sacraments uh, and, uh, that the church uh, uh, celebrates. So in the Catholic Church there are seven sacraments, all of which correspond to what Jesus did in his public ministry. And uh, first of all, there are several common signs or several signs of each sacrament. In all the celebrations of the sacraments, four signs are common to them. First of all, the people that gather. So where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he is present. Okay? So uh, in the baptized people, whether it's two or three, Christ is present. So, so that's one aspect of the sacraments. You have to have people to, to do it, okay, to celebrate them. The second thing that is common to all seven sacraments is that there has to be prayer to God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The third thing that is necessary, even if it's just one sentence, is a reading of Scripture. Uh, God communicates us through the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> and then the fourth thing that is present, you must have a minister for the sacrament, uh, a bishop or a priest or a deacon, and I'll tell you who uh, can do certain sacraments and who can't. But the bishop, the priest, and the deacon then act in the person of Jesus Christ. But they are not Jesus Christ. They only act in the person of Jesus Christ. So each sacrament, in addition to these four common signs, have their own particular signs that points to the hidden or invisible presence of Christ who continues his ministry in the church today. For holy baptism, what do you think the, the, the sign is, the primary sign? Water, okay. Water, what does water symbolize or point to in terms of what Jesus does for us? He cleanses us of what? Sin. Sin. Okay, what else does water do? Pardon? It brings, life. it brings life. You need water to sustain you. Jesus sustains you into life everlasting. What else does water do? Cleans, cleanses, okay, washes of sin. What else? There's another aspect. What about floods? It drowns you. It's destructive. Uh, and because of Jesus' death on the cross, baptism submerges us into his death as though we are drowning. And who captures that better than Catholics when they celebrate baptism? The Baptist, okay, when they dunk you underneath and you think you're drowning. And then the minister pulls you up and saves you, but it's Christ who's saving you, right? So that destructive element of water is actually a part of the, the Catholic understanding of baptism too. In fact, in the early church, uh, we, didn't do, we didn't do immersion quite like the Baptists do, but uh, they were normally kneeling in water and a lot of water was poured over them. And so there was that same sort of uh, dying and rising uh, symbolism. So water, but, but, it's, but in baptism, the water is the visible sign of whom? Christ, okay. So when I, what I dislike as a priest, and everybody says this in the Catholic Church, and you'll hear priests and others saying it, they'll say, baptism washes away original sin, and baptism gives you the Holy Spirit. Does baptism do that? 
Who does that? Christ does that, okay? Uh, water doesn't wash away original sin. Christ, who is water, washes away original sin. Does that make sense? Okay. Or forgives us our sins. Washes away sins in general. Okay, for confirmation, it's sacred chrism, which is an olive oil that is consecrated by the bishop and it has a balsam in it, so it's very sweet smelling. And this chrism is smeared on your forehead and this oil and smell seeps into your skin which is a, um, a metaphor or a sign of the Holy Spirit seeping not only to your skin and into your bones but into your, bone, uh, into your marrow and into your soul and changing your soul uh, with the presence of Christ. Now holy baptism does the same thing but confirmation simply strengthens that. Okay? And so the smell of the chrism makes you pleasing like you have the Holy Spirit when I baptize babies, I'll put a lot of chrism on their forehead and parents will tell me, I took the baby home and she smelled so nice all day long. Well, that's the whole point of that. It, it, it has a particular smell of, of, of the Holy Spirit, if you will. That, that uh, Jesus' uh, Spirit uh, makes us smell good. Uh, that's what happens when our sins are taken away. What is the, the primary sign of, of, oh gosh, I just, of the Holy Eucharist? Bread and wine, okay. Now, what does bread and wine do for us? Normally, before it's blessed or consecrated. It nourishes, sustains us. Bread, we break bread together, it unites us, right? Uh, that's what Jesus does. He nourishes and sustains us, he unites us as his church. What does wine do? Makes you happy. Christ gives joy to the heart. Uh, uh, it brings people together when they share wine. Also, you can pour wine on a cut, correct? Uh, and it has a medicinal effect. Christ's blood is healing uh, and, and brings us forgiveness. So the bread and wine point to Christ, who is like bread, or is bread, if we use it as a metaphor, and Christ, uh, who is wine. And it also uh, points to his blood, which is poured out for us, uh, for our salvation. But we're not receiving bread and wine, we're receiving Christ, correct? Once it's blessed. So the bread is the visible incarnational sign of the hidden or invisible Christ that we actually receive. But we cannot see at that particular time. The sacrament of penance is actually the laying on of hands. Now if you're behind the screen, you don't see this, but the priest raises his hand when he gives you absolution, which is the, con the, the way the ch early church uh, conveyed authority or, or showed the authority of the one praying over the person receiving the gift. In the anointing of the sick, again, it's oil that is blessed. It's a different type of oil, uh, not the chrism. And uh, again, it's like Jesus Christ who is a healing balm that we're receiving, uh, uh, or the oil of ole. Uh, but it's not the oil that we're celebrating, it's Christ who is oil. The oil just makes that visible and tangible. Does that make sense? Okay, and then holy orders, it's actually um, the, the laying on of hands by the bishop to the, to the one who's being ordained, and the Holy Spirit coming upon them, but it's their life, it's the life of the priest or the deacon or the, the bishop that uh, is actually the sacrament. Now, in, this, in the sacrament of marriage, what would you say is the, the sign? It's not the ring. It's the bride and groom, their life together. Okay, so in the sacrament of marriage is a little bit different uh, from the others that the ceremony is not the sacrament. The ceremony inaugurates the sacrament, but it's your life together once you consummate the marriage and live as husband and wife and start to form a, a Christian uh, family or, or household. And that you are meant to be a visible sign of, the ch of Christ whose bride is the church. Does that make sense? So the husband, in a sense, has to be kind of like Christ, who is the head of the church, the wife, uh, has to be kind of like the body of Christ, who uh, is the bride of the church. Um, uh, and that together they show forth uh, what the church is. Okay. Now baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist are referred to as the sacraments of initiation. How many of you in here are not baptized? There's just three, right? One, two, three. So at the Easter Vigil you will receive all three sacraments together and you'll be fully initiated into the church at the Easter Vigil. So you'll, you'll profess your, you'll reject, well we'll go over that in a second, you'll, you'll be baptized, you'll be confirmed, and then you'll receive Holy Communion. And then you'll be fully initiated into the church. 
Those of you who are already baptized, what you'll do is renew your baptismal promises, and then you'll be confirmed, and then receive Holy Communion. Okay? The sacraments of healing are uh, penance, or confession, and the anointing of the sick. And the sacraments of service are holy matrimony and holy orders. Now, in later classes, we're going to go over each one of those specifically. A sacrament has the threefold effect of recalling the past, bringing into the present what Christ does, and giving us hope for the future. The hope of salvation is new and eternal life in Christ. A sacrament is also an intimate encounter with Jesus Christ, and this takes faith to believe. It does not take faith to believe that Jesus existed 2,000 years ago. An atheist would have to say that. But it does take faith to believe that Jesus remains with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it does take faith to believe that Jesus is really present in the sacraments. It does take faith to believe that Jesus Christ will save us from sin and death and grant us eternal life. It does not take faith to believe that the sacraments symbolize Jesus Christ. An atheist would have to say that the bread and wine symbolizes Jesus Christ in the Mass. An atheist would have to say that the water symbolizes Jesus Christ washing away sin. The believer says, it is Jesus Christ that I'm receiving in the bread and wine. It is Jesus Christ who washed away my sins in the waters of baptism. You see the difference there? Okay, it's a big difference. Uh, and a very important difference. Now, the Catholic Church has a very rich liturgical tradition. And there are two main rites in the Catholic Church, R-I-T-E. There is the Western Rite, which would be Western Europe, the United States, and the southern, northern and southern hemispheres of those areas, okay? And in the Western Rite of the Catholic Church, um, as history was developing, eventually Latin became the official language of the liturgy of the church up until about 1965. It still is the official, but it was, it was used almost ex exclusively up until 1965. And the Latin Rite, or the Western Rite of the Catholic Church, uh, has several other subsets. We belong to the Latin Rite, or the Roman Rite, but there's also something called the Dominican Rite, where the Mass is slightly different than how we would celebrate Mass. And there's also the Ambrosian Rite from Milan, Italy, which is, again, slightly different than how we would celebrate Mass here at St. Joseph's. And now there is a new Western Rite, uh, by new it's maybe 30 or 40 years old, called the Anglican Use Rite or the, of the Anglican Ordinariate. It's how the Episcopalians celebrate the Mass, except they have now become Roman Catholic, have accepted the Pope, and the Mass that they celebrated as Episcopals uh, uh, was refined in order to make it valid as a Catholic Mass, but their ceremony is similar to what Anglicans would do. Uh, so there are several different rites in the Western Rite. Then there's a whole other rite called the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church. And that would be uh, churches in Eastern Europe, um, in Asia, uh, India, uh, uh, that the church's liturgy developed in a different way. It was the same teaching, but the ceremonies accompanying the liturgy developed in a different way. And there are several subsets of the Eastern Rite. The Byzantine Rite, the Alexandrian Rite, the Coptic Rite, the Syrian Rite, the Armenian Rite, the Maronite Rite, the Chaldean Rite, and there's one in India, and I can't think, the Malabar Rite in India. Are you familiar with the Malabar Rite in India? Uh, and all of these rites, their mass is celebrated quite different than how we celebrate the mass in the Latin Rite, but it has the same meaning, and it has the same structure, it just has different uh, ceremonies that go with that. Now, in the Eastern Rite, of the Catholic Church in the year 1020, what year was the Great Schism? 1054. 1054, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, well even before 1054, they were having squabbles all the time because their rites were different and the, the, the Western Rite said, ours is better than yours and the Eastern Rite says, no, ours is better than yours and the Western Rite where the Pope was, since he was the head of the church, tried to make the Eastern Rite more like the Latin Rite 
And the Eastern Rite didn't like that. And so there were all these squ political squirmishes going on as to authority and who had the best right and the best ceremonies. And eventually, in 1054, was the Great Schism, where the Church of the East broke away from the Pope because they felt the Pope was trying to make them like the Roman Rite. Does that make sense? Okay. But they, uh, apart from breaking communion with the Pope, they really didn't change any major church teachings. In fact, they kind of became a... Um, a time warp uh, as time went on because they didn't have any more ecumenical councils uh, and didn't have any more reforms. So the Eastern Orthodox is the, break, the broken away group, the group that broke away. So you'd have the Greek Orthodox, you have the Russian Orthodox, you have all kinds of Orthodox. But at the same time, some of those churches did not break away, remained in union with Rome. And then with others, sometimes 100 years later or 200 years later, maybe even 300 years later, they came back into full communion with Rome. And so the Orthodox churches that came back to full communion with Rome are called the Eastern Rite. Okay, does that make sense? But the Eastern Rite who accept the Pope also have a group outside of themselves that's just like them that does not accept the Pope. Okay? And if you go to their churches, you would not be able to tell the difference in terms of the Mass whatsoever, except the Eastern Rite acknowledges the Pope and prays for him, whereas the Eastern Orthodox do not, okay? Uh, does everybody understand that difference? Okay. okay. Now in Macon, it's hard to understand the difference because we don't have any Eastern Rite Catholic churches in Macon. There is one in Augusta, there's one in uh, Atlanta, and in other places. Jerry, did you have a question? Yeah. Did they have bishops? They have bishops just like we do. They have everything we have, except they don't accept the Pope. Okay, but they accept the, they, uh, for some of them acknowledge the Pope as a bishop, but not as the head of the church. Not, okay. Have, okay. We don't have, but the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Okay. So there are some Orthodox churches that are not in full communion with the Catholic Church, and then there are some Eastern churches that are, and they're called the Eastern Rite. It's very complicated, but if you. Now, the, the interesting thing is. If you can't find a Catholic church for Mass on Sunday, you could go to a Greek Orthodox or a Russian Orthodox church. And from our point of view as Catholics, you could receive Holy Communion there. But they don't want us to. So, <laughs> so, so, so don't, <laughs> unless they invite you. But if they invite you, then you could. Okay, so there's no problem on our part. Uh, and the same thing is true with the Orthodox. If they were to come to our Catholic Mass, and they were allowed to receive communion from their church's point of view at our Catholic Mass, we would allow them to do that, okay? We do not do that for Episcopalians, Lutherans, or otherwise, because the Protestant churches lost holy orders. They not only lost it, they, they uh, renounced it. Uh, and uh, so, so they don't have a valid priesthood. So for you to have a valid Mass, you have to have a valid priesthood. The Orthodox do, uh, and the Protestants don't. Okay, so that's just a, a very important difference there. Now, we celebrate the liturgy of the church primarily on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, and by the celebration of the Mass, which is central and obligatory. And it's based on the third commandment to keep holy the Lord's Day or to keep holy the Sabbath, but for Christians, the, the Sabbath is the Lord's Day or Sunday. But you could celebrate Sunday Mass by going to Mass on Saturday evening, okay? Because we believe now, actually we believed even before the Second Vatican Council, that Sunday begins at sundown the night before. Who else does that with their holy day? The Jews, okay? So we got it from them. So even before the Catholic Church allowed us to go to Mass on Saturday night, Sunday began Saturday night, what we call the vigil, and normally it was evening prayer that was Sunday evening prayer one. Uh, but then the church expanded that and said, well, we can also have Mass on Saturday night. So the way we keep the Lord's Day holy is by going to Mass every Sunday or Saturday night and avoiding um, unnecessary work, making Sunday a special day, a day of the family, a day of rest and relaxation, a day to just give thanks to God that after He created the world, He took a day to rest and we deserve the same thing. Uh, so, uh, so we should try to keep Sunday uh, holy. We also have what is called the liturgical year. Uh, we're currently in, at the very beginning of the liturgical year in the Catholic Church. So we began 
On Sunday, uh, I should have said at the Mass, or Father David, but he probably did not, and I didn't either, we should have said, Happy New Year, because the first Sunday of Advent begins the new liturgical year of the Church. And the uh, Advent is four Sundays long, or four weeks long. Uh, so last Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent, this coming Sunday is the second Sunday of Advent. What color does the priest wear? purple or violet. And then the third Sunday of Advent is called Gaudete or Rejoice Sunday. And what color candle is lighted on the Advent wreath? Rose. Rose. And what color vestment does the priest wear? Rose. Rose. Okay. <laughs> then we have the fourth Sunday of Advent when, where all four uh, Advent candles are lighted. And, uh, and then Christmas occurs. Now this year Advent is the longest possible. We have, it has the most days possible because the fourth Sunday of Advent is on a Sunday and then a whole week later, the next Sunday is Christmas Day, correct? Now, next year is a leap year, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, let's pretend it was not a leap year. Next year, um, when would be Christmas Eve? What day? If it, had not, if it was not a leap year? Sunday. Sunday night, okay? So, the fourth Sunday of Advent would be in the morning and that night would be Christmas, so it would be the shortest uh, possible Advent, okay? Uh, whereas this year is the longest, next year would be the next to the, the, the shortest, because it'll be the next day. I hate it when that happens. Because, <laughs> because you have to have Sunday morning Advent Masses, and then everybody has to come back again for Christmas Eve Masses. And then you have to decorate the church somewhere in between. Uh, so that the fourth Sunday of Advent doesn't look too Christmassy. But by the time they come back at 4 p.m. that afternoon, it's all Christmas. So it's, it's, it's really tough. I mean, hey, it's horrible. Okay. Okay. Um, then the next season after Advent is the Christmas season. That usually lasts two or three weeks and concludes with the Feast of the Epiphany, which technically should be on this, uh, January 6th. But if it's not a Sunday, uh, we've, moved we've moved Epiphany to the closest Sunday after January 6th. Uh, and then also the baptism of the Lord is part of the Christmas season, but is the bridge to ordinary time. So after Epiphany and baptism of the Lord, we have the uh, winter ordinary time. And then we have Lent, which is a movable feast or movable season of the church, depending on when Easter is going to be. So Ash Wednesday begins Lent, and then six weeks later is Easter Sunday. And then East, the Easter season lasts seven weeks and concludes with the Feast of Pentecost. And then we go into <laughs> spring and summer and fall ordinary time. And then the whole thing starts over again with Advent. Then during the year, we also have solemnities of the Lord, like Christ the King, and, and uh, then we also have different feasts for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Apostles, the Martyrs, and holy men and women of the Church. So, how does one celebrate the sacrament of baptism? Well, I'm going to speak about how we celebrate baptism for children or for infants, I should say. So in the Catholic Church, we have, we know, for Catholic families, it is our custom and our tradition to baptize infants and we recommend that they baptize their infants, parents baptize their infants as soon as possible uh, within the first two or three months of their life, okay? Or even earlier if you want to, but, but normally it's, does anybody have a specific on that? I don't think there's any specific, but, but the recommendation is within the first two or three months uh, of the baby being born. So when, when I celebrate the sacrament of baptism, you have to have the parents, obviously, the child to be baptized, and two godparents, a godmother and a godfather. And then anybody else can come and watch. So the beginning of the ceremony, you have the sign of the cross and the greeting, and then I trace the cross on the forehead of the child, and I invite the parents and godparents to do the same. Then we have a scripture reading, a short homily. Then after the homily, uh, we have what is called the exorcism and then the anointing with the oil of catechumens. The exorcism is simply to call upon God to purify this child of the residue of original sin and to sanctify this child. So it's not like a major, like I don't say, out of this child, Satan! No, uh, it's a very, um, 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 
sober prayer that is not frightening to the child or the parents or anybody watching, okay? But it does call upon uh, the Holy Spirit to purify this child. And then we put the oil of catechumens. So there are three types of oils in the Catholic Church. The oil of catechumens, the oil of the sick, and sacred chrism. The oil of catechumens is placed on the chest of the baby to, you know, like when knights were, would be sent out into battle, they would be anointed for protection. Well, this is kind of a protection of the Holy Spirit after the exorcism takes place. And it's a minor exorcism. Um, then, after the anointing, uh, we, the parents uh, and the godparents who represent the child, uh, there's a formula where I say, do you reject Satan? I do. And all his empty promises, I do. Then do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I do. And, and then the rest of the creed is uh, uh, pronounced that way. And that will occur also at the Easter Vigil for you all. Then the water is blessed, and then the child... Uh, there's two ways that we can do infant baptism. The, the, the way that I have done all my priesthood, except for maybe twice in, in the 31 years I've been a priest, is the, the head of the infant is placed over the font backwards, and I take a shell, a, a metal shell, a brass shell, and I take the blessed water in the shell and I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I pour the water over the child's head, which accomplishes uh, the same thing. Or I could take the child who is naked and place him or her in the font three times. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I give the child back to the, to the uh, godmother or the, God, or the parents. Uh, so that's called immersion for children, and it's an option that's available, but nobody ever picks that. Um, then, after the child is, is um, baptized, then sacred chrism is smeared on their head to symbolize that this child not only has been washed clean of original sin by Jesus, but Jesus' Holy Spirit is given to this child as well as that oil seeps into their head. It's done on the crown of the head. Then we give them a white garment. Normally the, the parents already have the white garment on the child ahead of time. So I simply point out to the white garment that you have become a new creation and have clothed yourself in Christ. And then they also receive a candle that is lighted from the Easter candle, which represents that they have been enlightened by Christ and they are to walk always as children of the light. And then there's some a final, you know, the Lord's Prayer we anticipate the next sacraments, which would be uh, Confirmation and Holy Eucharist, and then uh, there's a final blessing and a special blessing for the parents. Okay. Any question on the, the format of baptism okay. for infants? For adults, it's a little bit different, but very similar. So for those of you who will be baptized at the Easter Vigil, it'll be a much bigger ceremony, first of all. It's one of the biggest ceremonies that the Catholic Church has all year long. And within the context of the Easter Vigil, Water will be consecrated uh, and blessed, and then you'll be baptized, uh, and you'll just stick your head over the font. I won't strip you of your clothes and dump you three times. <laughs> so, <laughs> that'd be interesting to see. And then, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, then you would be anointed uh, for confirmation and receive communion. Now, in Catholic teaching, holy baptism is necessary for salvation. Okay. And that Christ has given the church the means necessary for our salvation in holy baptism. But that does not mean that Almighty God can work independently of the church to save someone. So just because we say that uh, baptism is necessary for salvation, that is how we understand how the church uh, conveys baptism. But God can step outside the bounds of the church that he has created to save anybody he desires. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, one of the reasons why, what we say, why we say that baptism is necessary is because St. Paul says, unless you are baptized by water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, who do you think that he was referring to? He was referring to people like you all who are going through a process of conversion and let's say that you have come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the church is founded by Him and that the only way to heaven is through the church and you decide not to be baptized. Then I would say to you, unless you're baptized by water and the Holy Spirit, you will not go to heaven. Okay. So if you know better and refuse it, then you're held accountable. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what St. Paul was speaking to these kinds of people. 
Now, as time went on, you know, in the early church, the primary groups of people being baptized were adults, right? Either converting from Judaism or, or from uh, the pagan religions of the day. But infant baptism or baptism of children was done as well because whole families would come into the church. So infants would be baptized back then too. Now, by the time the church becomes the cultural force in society, you have fewer and fewer adult converts to Catholicism, but you have children being born into Catholic families and they're being baptized. So the primary people being baptized are infants, correct? What happens to an infant that dies before baptism? We don't know. Pardon? We don't know. Well, that was the controversy back then because there were a lot of infants dying. There was a high infant mortality rate. And there were some in the Catholic Church who were saying, well, St. Paul says unless you're baptized by water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So your baby's going to hell, okay, if he's not baptized. Then there were others who were saying, well, certainly God wouldn't be so mean to a little innocent baby and prevent this child from going to, uh, he would prevent this child from going to hell, but they can't go to heaven, so they must be in another place called limbo, which is very nice and idyllic, and, and you know, they really are happy there, but God is not there. Uh, so those two choices, which would you prefer, limbo or hell? Okay. Well, limbo became the popular teaching, but it was never made an official teaching of the church, okay, uh, ever. But I was taught in the 1950s and early 60s that it was an official teaching of the church, but the nuns were wrong. It never was an official teaching of the church. It was just a theological idea because we thought it sounded better than God condemning these poor little infants to hell forever, okay. Now we would say that God can step out of the <laughs> bounds of the church and do what he wishes to do. And if he wishes to save this child in heaven, then he can do it. Okay? Yes? When someone refers to the holy innocents, when the Catholic priest refers to the holy innocents, what is he talking about? The, uh, um, the, the babies that were murdered by Herod after Jesus and Mary and Joseph fled into Egypt. Remember, he, he orders all those children two years old and younger murdered. Well, that I see. That, well, that's another possibility too. Yeah, yeah exactly. right. Because they're technically right, and we would say that they, uh, because of their situation, although they would be would have been born with original sin, are sinless in terms of actual sin. Yeah. So that would be. So you can say that apart. You know, Protestants accuse Catholics of saying that Mary is sinless, and therefore we treat her like a god. But technically, we see others being sinless too, given their state in life. Okay, that's possible, okay? Um, some extremists come into this room right now and demand that we renounce Jesus Christ and bow down to the God they worship. And you two guys who are baptized, try, uh, or not baptized, try to overpower them and you get killed in the process. In a sense, you have died for the faith and are martyrs, and you receive what's called the baptism of blood, okay, and are treated as martyrs of the church, so you go to heaven immediately. There are no virgins up there waiting for you. Uh, so, <laughs> but you do get to go to heaven <laughs> if you die for the okay. so, The only incentive is that you get to see God, not these virgins. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> well, that's the next one. The, the baptism of desire also would fall, uh, you would qualify for that as well because you have a desire to be baptized. You've already gone through a, a serious rite of the Catholic Church. Uh, so let's say that you died before the Easter Vigil. The baptism of desire would kick in. But it would also kick in for parents who intended to have their child baptized and the child died before baptism. And so that would call, be called baptism of desire as well. Now, bishops, priests, and deacons are the normal ministers of holy baptism. I have communion on my notes here, but it's a, a, a baptism. But anyone can, in an emergency, if they have the intention of the church, baptize. So there are all kinds of stories of nurses and doctors baptizing babies being born that are about to die. All they do is take water and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and make sure it goes over their head. Yes? Oh, I was trained in firefighting. I do CPR. All this stuff. I've never had to use it. Mm -hmm. So if you would please invite me 
Just in case. If you if you find out that the person's never been baptized, all you have to do is take some water and just it doesn't have to be a big ceremony, just have baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It can be very quietly done. But you'd have to know that they're not baptized. Okay. And you should I don't and this was a question earlier somewhere. Should you baptize somebody who wouldn't want to be baptized? Uh, I, of course the baby is a different situation. Yeah. Would it have any effort? I think it would. Yeah, I think it would. Yeah. Right, right, and now that would be different. I think uh, then you would. That's kind of a desire. So you wouldn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Then you should do it. Yeah. Yeah. And let's say that you couldn't, but it has to be where you can't get a priest or a deacon or a bishop. So you can't just do it willy nilly. It has to be a real, true emergency. Correct. You can't do that. <laughs> You can do it to Father Davi, but don't do it to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, the, the phrase there, if they have the intention of the church, what does that mean? The person that's baptizing, so they kind of understand that, that this is necessary for salvation, and they're not doing it superstitiously, okay, uh, um, in that regard. I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Okay, now you're saying, uh, while I've been reading, you know, you have to be baptized and say, but that's not all of it. You know, you have to like, you know, love the Lord Jesus Christ. Correct, and correct, Christ. correct. Okay. Say this person, you know, that you bat to whoever, whatever, dying or, and wants to be baptized, but if they've not done that, so what good is the baptism? I just want to well, it would, that's what's interesting about baptism. It is a pure gift for the one who receives it. For example, remember in Jesus' public ministry, he forgave people that never asked for forgiveness. And they, they were wondering, what, 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 forgiven? I mean, uh, you know, they weren't even sorry for what they had, had committed. Uh, so, so baptism is that gift that is given. So those of you who are being baptized, your, all your sins, both original and any actual sins that you've committed, will be washed away. Okay? So you don't have to confess those. But later, after the sins you commit after baptism, there has to be repentance and a firm intent not to sin again in that particular way. So that the, what you're speaking of kicks in at that point. Okay? Uh, so for the sacrament of penance or going to confession, it's not automatic. Just because the priest gives you absolution, if there is no true repentance or sorrow, then it's an invalid uh, sacrament. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But not so for baptism. I don't think that there's any such thing as an invalid baptism that's properly performed. And so it doesn't hinge on the person who's receiving it. Okay. There's a difference between ordinary means and extraordinary. Right. Ordinary and extraordinary. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yes. Isn't it also true that somebody that, uh, like a Scientologist in an emergency could baptize somebody? If they had the intention of the church uh, and kind of basically understood what the church understands about baptism, and most people m might intellectually know what that is, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, a bit different than Catholic baptism and the Protestant baptism. Yes, I'm baptized twice. Um, the Baptist church didn't think my Methodist baptism was quite good enough. So. And they wouldn't think your Catholic one is either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. But anyway. Idea that I I'm making the leap of faith, and this is a symbol of my faith. And Catholic baptism with the infants is not that correct. It, it's a matter of the parents. Well, that's a good question. Let me let me explain that. That's very good. Um, I was going to say something else before that, though, um, based on what you were asking. Um, it is. For adult baptism, that's necessary in the Catholic Church, that those of you being baptized have to have the intention, uh, we're hopeful uh, that you will have the intention to follow through on being baptized, that you'll try to live a, a holy life, the Catholic faith, and, and so, so the, your, your decision that has come about by the grace of God, not on your own, but by the grace of God is necessary. But what we say unlike, let's say, Southern Baptist and, or maybe some other Christian uh, churches, is that in baptism, God chooses us and accepts us. Okay? It's not the other way around. 
It's not that we've chosen God and accepted Him. He has chosen us and accepted us. You see the difference? So the, the, the onus is on what God is doing, not what I'm doing. Okay? Because if the onus is on what I'm doing, then, and this is what Baptists supposedly do not believe, you're saying your good works is what saves you because you chose to be baptized. And you're choosing to be baptized or, or you're choosing to accept Jesus Christ is what saves you. Work. Correct. And it, it's, it's, it's ironic that Protestants fuss about the Catholics and all that works righteous make one of the most important sacraments of the faith into a work itself. Correct. And, you know, Baptists always go, who do you say, who do you say, who do you say? The best response I've ever heard to that was from a Presbyterian minister, Baptist preacher, asked, when will you say, he said, at Calvary. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I suggest Catholics say. I was, it was saved at Calvary or when Jesus was crucified. Um, but our belief is that all of the sacraments are the initiative of God, not our initiative. And that if we have responded, it's because God has planted His grace, that He has called us and we have heard the call and have responded. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Very Calvinist. Yes. <laughs> I would say yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, I, I would say that somehow God's grace is there. Right. Why would you do it if you didn't have the intention? Right, that you would wonder why are they doing it. I'm just saying it's kind of... Yeah. It's kind of a Right. 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 For example, well, let me give you another example. Let's say that as a Catholic priest, I lose my faith and become an atheist. Okay, I, I become an atheist. But I'm still functioning as a Catholic priest, so I'm still hearing confessions, I'm still baptizing, and I'm still celebration, celebrating Mass. Is, are those sacraments invalid? No. no. Because I'm still doing the intention of the Church if I follow the format that is given. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so it doesn't hinge upon my personal holiness or lack thereof. No one's unbelief. Right. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that. So I would say that the person who at least does the ceremony, and the basic is, it's very simple. I baptize. You have to say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as they're pouring water on the child. Or, it's received. Correct. So I wouldn't worry about what do they understand about it. Let's just pray that they understood enough to do it correctly. Okay. Right. Yeah, it, it, that's a little bit, uh, I can see how, right. right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I want to go back to the parents. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Did you want to be sure you know what you want to say? Yes. Uh, now, for infants, that is the clearest sign that God chooses us before we have the ability to choose him. And he has used the parents to bring those children to him. Or he motivates or calls them. Now, but that's, that call occurs through the church because the church has taught the parents that you need to do that. So, so, so there is, uh, you know, the, the incarnational aspect of that call is made manifest through the expectation that people know of from the church. Does that make sense? Okay, on that. But it's God who accepts his child, and, and, and we as Catholics believe that you are reborn in baptism. And just as you didn't have a choice as to which family you're going to be born into, technically you don't always have a choice if you're going to be baptized or born into the family of God. Okay, uh, but you can leave if you wish. Okay, once you get to be, or you can strengthen that if you wish. Uh, so you can push God out of your life if you wish. He's like a little baby; you can push him or toss him. Uh, you can throw him out. Uh, you can throw the baby out with bathwater if you wish, uh, and and Jesus goes. Or you can <laughs> choose to keep Christ in your life, and if you do that, that's by the grace of God. Okay. 
Now, uh, what we'd like to do tonight, which we probably haven't done, we have, uh, let's take 10 minutes to do it. If uh, our table leaders would lead the discussion of chapter 14, if you look on page, um, page 176, there are three questions. How might you participate more fully, more consciously, and more actively in Sunday Mass in a culture that is centered on the weekend? What can people do to observe Sunday as a day dedicated to God? Number two, review the definition of the sacraments. How would you explain its elements to others? And then number three, in what ways are you aware of the link between liturgy and your daily life? How you live your life? So why don't you take a few minutes to just, you don't have to do all of them specifically, but we'll take 10 minutes at 8.30 we'll conclude.